Good afternoon, everybody. Hello? Hello. 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 How are you? Can you believe it that it's raining today? And woo and cold and miserable. What happened to spring? I was just in DC over the weekend. It was the sweetest scene. It was all blue and that tender green on the trees. It was paradise. But this is our intellectual paradise. We are here. Um, and I, I'm delighted to get the chance to talk to you about what is very much a work in progress. What I want to talk to you about is how I want to spend my summer vacation. And uh, here's the backstory. I'm Susan Crawford. I'm a professor here at the law school. And I'm one of the many directors of the Berkman Center and proud of my affiliation with the center, which has been very supportive of me. Um, I'm a new professor. Just got here this year. So. Um, the backstory, the really, really deep backstory, is that I uh, come from a very quiet background, extremely quiet. I now understand that I had an academic childhood. I didn't really know that when I was going through it. But at the time, I just noticed there was like nobody talking to us. Um, and it was very, very, very withdrawn, very quiet. And so when I was a young lawyer, the advent of the internet, the idea of the internet, that anybody could communicate with anybody else without asking permission, that anybody could be in touch with anybody else, introduce something new, was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me. Um, I was so lucky that in 95, I was sitting at my desk in Washington. I was a, a lawyer at Wilmer Cutler. And we suddenly had a browser. And we're suddenly looking at websites. And I remember distinctly the very first site I ever went to. I'm from Santa Monica, California, and this is a beach house called The Spot that was online with this line saying, click here if you want to talk to us, these 20-something people. And I distinctly remember clicking. And it was like the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Unbelievable that you could reach back beyond the coats and see these people. Extraordinary. Those of you who've grown up online, I'm an old curmudgeon now, don't recognize how amazing this is. So there was the spot there, my introduction. Somehow that brought me to be on the board of ICANN, which is a little different as an experience. Um, but it gave me a real sense of the importance around the world of a globally interoperable internet and the desires of people to connect. I spent some time in the administration, the very first year of Mr. Obama, when uh, it was all very entrepreneurial. And I learned a ton. Um, I had a sort of a tech poobah job there. And what I learned was that there are all kinds of heroes inside government. And they're all doing their best to coordinate, but it's nearly impossible to get anything done. And I had this alarming experience I often talk about these days of going to talk to a senior official in the administration about replacing um, subsidies for phone access in America with subsidies for high-speed internet access. And he, they're all he, so I'm not giving anything away. He looked at me blankly and said, but phones are two-way. <laughs> All right, so that was alarming, and that gave me the sense that there was a lot to be learned in government about the internet, about internet access. And I also learned that everybody does everything through meetings, and I kind of like meetings, so that was okay with me. <laughs> I came out of that and I wrote a book called Captive Audience about the role of the cable industry in uh, America. And in doing that, I did a ton of interviews with people who all refused to speak to me on the record because they were too afraid of uh, the power of Comcast, Time Warner Cable, and their brethren, who had divided up the country, uh, divided markets, and had enormous influence over the destiny of any business that wanted to be online, and any career of anybody who wanted to work in telecommunications <laughs> policy. Learned a lot through doing that. Um, I became interested in how, how do you get politicians to respond to these problems, especially when no one's voting in elections, the worst voter turnout in 72 years, uh, last midterm election. Um, and the pull of democracy, I began having these big thoughts about democracy. And I'd been at the international level, and then at the national level, and then I decided that cities were really the places where things happened. Um, and that because expectations were high, because we're all getting used to the internet, cities need to resist becoming anachronisms and learn how to govern themselves and give opportunities um, and understand technology. So, it's okay. You're being webcast, that's all I want to let you know. Uh, so cities are big, everybody's moving there, and that, this all led me, love of cities, to this, the second book, The Responsive City, 
which was also a great adventure and for which I did a gazillion interviews with heroes in city halls across America and has led me to be quite involved in the responsive city movement, the idea that you use data and uh, sensors and smart people inside City Hall to make better decisions and improve the lives of people in cities. And this is a big moment for U.S. cities. It's like our fourth era. People were moving out of U.S. cities between 1920, uh, 1920 and 2010, real hollowing out, starting in 2011 especially with students and everybody like that. They're moving to students, to cities. Cities are becoming the places for development. Um, suburbs are starting to shrink. So we've been through the steam engine, the electrical grid, cars. These are all eras of cities. And now we're in the fiber data era of cities. I, I now have this big push in my life, which is to talk about fiber optic communications. And I'm going to bring this all together as you help me work on my summer project. So on the upper left is um, copper wire uh, used for telephone calls. Our phone system in the United States was the envy of the world when it was introduced. The first national phone system to, to be uh, beautifully functional. Uh, we then saw the advent of the cable guys with their hybrid fiber coaxial cables there on the right. It can carry much more information than the copper phone line. Um, and, but was originally built to be a broadcast medium. So you're sending TV over a cable to hilly places in Pennsylvania that couldn't get it. That's how the cable industry starts. They then devote a little bit of their access to the internet, but most of their digital channels are devoted to their own content, their own ways of slicing and dicing. You want to hear more about that, I can talk your ear off about it, but that's the cable wire. And now we've got the future-proof uh, medium for data, as far as we can tell, is fiber. Fiber optic, these tiny glass tubes, another dreamy slide about fiber, um, that, have, are, that are lit by lasers carrying, as far as we can tell, unlimited amounts of information. If you get the lasers tuned right and split right, they can carry gazillions of phone calls. So you only have to know about four wires for my little talk. Um, copper wire was used for DSL split into two frequencies, and a digital subscriber line is now known as the new dial-up. People are running from it in droves. That's the cable plant, hybrid fiber coaxial, little portion of the pipe, allocated internet access, high capacity downstream, really cramped upstream, unless cable rebuilds everything. Fiber to the node, uh, getting fiber deep into neighborhoods, but the problem is that you then use copper, AT&T does this, to get into houses, and so your ability to participate, remember my lonely childhood, to be part of the world is a little cramped, relying on fiber to the node, because you you're, have to be very close to a central office to have very high uh, upstream or downstream speeds. And then the gold standard, which is fiber to the home, potentially unlimited capacity, easily symmetrical, which means easy opportunity for creativity, uploading as well as downloading, um, future proof, all you do once it's in the ground is upgrade the electronics. So that's it. Here's the problem for the United States as a country. Our fiber penetration is far beneath Japan, Korea, Sweden, Estonia, Norway. We're way down the list uh, behind Luxembourg and the Netherlands. And only a step ahead, in fact, we're only a step ahead of Mexico when it comes to fiber to the home penetration in the United States. This is the OECD's most recent figures. And as a country, we're stuck. We're stuck. So here's the basic map. Uh, if you talk about internet access as anything over 20, 200 kilobits a second, like really minimal internet access, here's the story. In very low density areas, about 5% of the country, um, low numbers of adoption, DSL, that copper connection is really strong. Satellite and fixed wireless are also important. So if you grew up in rural Vermont, this might be what you're relying on, a satellite connection that's very capped, doesn't allow you to use a whole lot of data. Somebody told us yesterday that you would burn through your monthly data allowance in one hour if you streamed video over your satellite connection in rural Vermont. Pretty, pretty amazing. Um, low density airport areas, about 20% of the country. Cable is do dominant. This is a ver better value proposition than satellite, fixed wireless, or DSL. And that's what you that yeah. In the, first, that's what in the first one, you said you that. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, universal service funding support is the federal government is subsidizing um, copper line connections, continuing to subsidize them. So that keeps them um, entrenched. Uh, in the majority of the country, 
we've got a very static world where telco has about 30% of the subscriptions. It's mostly DSL, and the rest is cable. And then in very high density areas, like Cambridge, Massachusetts, cable dominates, so you have no choice other than Comcast in Cambridge. And there's a little bit of fiber to the premises. Uh, Verizon has built out to now about 8 million subscribers and has, uh, with its Fios fiber product, it's actually sold off its systems in Texas, Florida, and California. But we have a little bit of fiber to the premises. And we have no national path to make an upgrade to fiber. Um, the cable companies long ago divided up the country. They don't face competition between each other. Not only that, but in some of those big square states in the west of the country, um, uh, the, there are telcos that don't themselves compete with anybody else either. So uh, lots of service level power. Um, wireless, I'm going to speak more about wireless because that's one of the key decisions we have to make, how to, how to push forward with uh, new generation wireless in, in company with fiber. But it's, it's complementary. It's not a substitute for what you can do over a wired connection. Most people who have a smartphone also have a wire at home. It's uh, very closely related. If you're smartphone only, it's very likely that you're poor or have fewer opportunities. Um, and so the big picture, so that whole script was about um, broadband at very low speeds. As we move towards the future, anything over 25 megabits per second, there really is very little choice. 20% um, of homes can't buy it at any price. And taken together, about three quarters of American homes have no choice in providers, and prices are unconstrained. And it's all cable, which is, again, very cramped on the upstream, um, complete pricing power, and no particular incentive to upgrade to fiber, which is the better and future-proof technology around the world. This is a particularly terrible problem in inner city America. 60% of Detroit residents don't have a wired home because it's too expensive. Um, expense is very highly correlated with non-adoption. In many of our big cities in America and smaller cities, um, very low internet adoption at home. There are a bunch of cities, this is a brave little map from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, a bunch of cities across the country working on installing fiber on their own, sort of trying to do it. Um, and so I'm very proud of Team Fiber and Dave Talbot here at the Berkman Center who have put out, where is Dave? I just saw you. There you are. A terrific report uh, last week about the situation in western Massachusetts, where towns are trying to do this for themselves, but it's very difficult. So what's amazing about this in the big picture is that around the world, fiber to the home is exploding. China plans to have more people on, more new people on fiber than all the existing subscribers in South Korea today. They plan this year to convert more people to fiber than everybody in South Korea. That's huge. And fiber is growing by 60% over the last year that we know about, 2014 to 2015, around the world. Cable is very small in growth around the world. Big in the United States, small everywhere else. Um, people are fleeing copper. That's the diminishing almost 20% of copper. Uh, there's, there's some growth in fiber to the node. Satellite grows, wireless grows. But it's real. that's the remarkable thing, that around the world, fiber is a big, a big deal. And my vision of the future is that this becomes akin to the internet stack, that uh, every, every city in America should have fiber available on a wholesale basis. I'll talk more about that if you'd like, uh, which means available for lease to any retail provider so that you have a competing, thriving market in fiber optic, two-way, unlimited communications, sensors, open data, screens, algorithms. This becomes the way we start seeing the world through uh, a multi-layered electronic visual. But this all sounds a little inhuman. Um, let's do a little bit more. Google's self-driving car is going to produce a terabyte of data a minute, a gigabyte of data every minute. Everything we want to do for science and agriculture and small businesses is going to depend on fiber. Cloud storage, data processing, sensor data is going to be overwhelming. We really need this. No delays, unending increase in capacity. And it's cheaper in the long run if we upgrade because uh, copper, <coughs> this rain affects copper badly. That's why uh, your phone service, landline phone service, if you still has it, have it, goes out when it rains. Um, and a fiber it doesn't get interfered with in the same way. Wireless you know, remains a really interesting world, but you need fiber for wireless. Um, 
and we're, there's a big potential for fixed wireless point of sight communications to carry a whole bunch of data, but that data needs to go somewhere. Um, and there's especially issues with availability of backhaul for wireless. All, what I mean by backhaul is just, you have to think of a wireless system as 95% a wire. And that the wireless that you're using is like an airplane. That airplane needs an airport to land in. And so if you say, well, all we need is wireless, that's like saying all we need is airplanes, no airports. You need a wire for your communications to go to and, and travel around the world. So they're, they're, wireless is fascinating, and we need to make some great decisions about that. The fundamental one is fiber. Um, so this summer, what I want to do is write the roadmap for the future for America um, and say, this is what we won't be unless we make this upgrade. Now, each chapter is going to be about one of these sectors. We won't be the leading healthcare nation in the world. We won't have energy independence. We won't achieve a transportation revolution here in America. We won't have the best education available to everyone. We won't be engaging our citizens, because we can't. The whole thing's built on sand unless you can move data around. We won't be exploring space. We won't be building respect for people with disabilities. We won't see the creativity explosion they'll see in other countries that have made or are making this upgrade. And this all amounts to new jobs as well as everything else. I got really fixated on the idea of human presence as the killer application for fiber. Uh, if you've never experienced it, if you're on a fiber connection with somebody else, it's as if there's just a pane of glass between you and them. No latency, no jitter, no delay, totally human. And what that makes possible is eye contact. And that makes possible all kinds of engagement that we're not capable of carrying out over existing um, cable connections. Here's my example of this. Um, uh, researchers tested two rabbits for tricks. The rabbits that's making eye contact with you is the rabbit you're likely to buy. And how about that? <laughs> how about that? Because we can connect to a rabbit, right? And kids, the, the cereal manufacturers know this. And so they, they have downward looking eyes So because the kids are in the aisle looking up. And if the kids connect with the character, they're going to want the cereal. Right? How fundamental is that? So <laughs> fiber is going to make this all possible. So I just went to Stro Stockholm. So I got you, right? So you're not going to forget the rabbit. If you remember one thing, you'll remember the rabbit. I just went to Stockholm. That's me peering because I'm too vain to wear my glasses. I probably should be wearing them even now. Uh, what they're showing me in Kishta Science City, which is this totally cool, um, enormous innovation area outside Stockholm, where there are three universities, thousands of startups and giant companies. They're showing how um, after you got home, after having experienced a stroke, a doctor using a fiber connection could be on the screen guiding you through your exercises, right? Uh, you can connect with that doctor because, again, there's eye contact, compassion, empathy, connection. Uh, and they're sweets, their arms are all folded, but I'm totally excited. I think this is a thrill. <laughs> and in, in Stockholm, they're carrying out some pilots with older people trying to help them stay at home. I have an aging parent here in Cambridge. I care about this a lot. Help people stay at home and not have to go out and slip on the ice, go see a doctor, because you can actually visit your doctor through that pane of glass. Um, I'm a violist, so I care about this. Wouldn't it be cool if you could actually play together at a distance? And you can do this with these connections. There's no latency, no delay. You feel as if you are in the same room. And until you've experienced it, you're not going to believe me. So um, I'm just going to keep talking about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I also heard this story in Sweden. This is called a synchrotron. It's being built outside Lund, which is a magical place in Sweden. Synchrotron, pretty great. Huh? That's, it's a particle accelerator using magnets to focus light so intently. We've never seen light like this before. Researchers go there to examine the atomic level of materials. Pause. Imagine if you could see the atomic level of a drug of a, of a uh, substance in nature, you could actually begin to understand how it's going to interact with everything else in our world. This is extraordinary. The researchers, though, when they go to Lund, to the synchrotron, have giant capacity hard drives in their briefcases because you can't stream this data over existing connections in uh, Europe. You might within Sweden, where there is a lot of fiber, but nowhere else. Also giant implications for research, for everything else we want to learn. You have to have this point-to-point -point, uh, capacity in place. Um, civic engagement, also, this is part of the story. This is something we won't have without making the upgrade to fiber, uh, where we could possibly see our government acting. I'm enthusiastic about this. We, 
with a thick mesh of civic engagement, people would remember what the role of government is in their lives. It wouldn't be just, you know, I pay you taxes, you deliver me services, but a much richer connection. Uh, they're also talking to me in, in Stockholm about wanting to be the smartest city in the world by, you know, next week, using uh, sensors and electric cars and all this stuff. This all requires fiber in order to work. Um, understanding your environment, understanding how things are moving around your city. Uh, they're, they're polite, so they say, target smart city, question mark, but they really do intend to be the, the smartest. And uh, this is also a huge implications for energy, being able to track energy use, understand it, um, uh, and connect that to use of public spaces, and push a lot of this into open data formats so that businesses and citizens can understand what's going on. All, all, all based on this substrate of fiber. So this, that, this is what I'm doing. What America's future won't be. I want to make it really optimistic uh, and pull in all these stories from around the world. I have to go to, apparently I've been told, I have to go to Dubai and Singapore. I've been to Stockholm and Seoul and uh, last year I went to Cuba, which gives you the other side of the story. It is wrenching, so awful. And China is also an interesting part of the story. I have a couple more trips to make, clearly. But a lot of this can be done uh, with um, you know, bright people working with me, just dreaming about what we could be, what we could be as a country and won't be unless we um, make this move. So uh, that's, that's my allotted time. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. And now I would like to brainstorm about what else we might not be or what I should be working on this summer. Because I'm just devoted to this. I'm not going to travel. I'm, she says, she always says that, and she does stuff. But, I really want to just sit down. The only way to write a book is ABC, apply bottom to chair. You just sit down, don't do anything. And I have a whole bunch of material from trips and, and learning and everything I've been doing with fiber over the last three years, and I'm trying to pull it all together. But if you were me, what would you do? Come on. Yes. <laughs> what I would like to know more about, oh, thanks. Beatbox time. Um, <laughs> what I would like to know more about is this whole idea of data caps and how they came yeah. to be. Like, you know, from where I'm sitting, it seems like it was a scam to begin with. Total like, scam. oh yeah, there's, yeah. you know, we've got 0.01% of our customers using yeah. this much data, which is going to hurt everybody, mm -hmm. blah, 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 and then boom, data caps. Right. I wrote a piece about this called Big, Big Cable Sledgehammer is Coming Down which explains exactly how the whole, the, the timeline, yeah, you put the cap way out here, and you say, well, what could be more fair than that? You know, uh, Americans love fairness. It's one of our most treasured values. And so you say, well, it's only fair that people that are using more data should have to pay more after a certain part. And as far as we can tell, it's only about 2% of our users right now doing that. So of course we should do it. Well, given all these developments, that usage cap becomes incredibly helpful. You, you're able to replicate in the wired world what you have in the wireless world. Right now, this is why you wouldn't substitute your smartphone for a wire, because you would hit your data caps and start incurring overages very quickly. If you, if you tried to swap out all, let's say, the TV watching, you're all too intelligent to be doing that, but all the TV watching that most people do, from a wire to a smartphone, you'd pay $500 a month for that smartphone. So, yeah, data caps are enormous, and how did that happen? It just happened, and because we don't have a competitive market, um, and the commission, the FCC at the moment, is not taking on things like rates, we have nothing to say about it. So that's why I'm so interested in just if avoiding the cable guys. I should have put a big picture of Jim Carrey here. I have a wonderful one. Avoiding them and moving right to fiber. Can yeah. much difference in places where they're, sorry, where, in places where there are multiple providers, such as Somerville, which has both it has two cable providers serving the whole city, or places that have both Verizon, FiOS, and, and a cable company, uh, are things a lot better there? And if not, why aren't they? Two doesn't make a competitive market. What we see is it's like Shamu and Godzilla. You know, They're both invented and huge, and they kind of pretend to fight with each other, but they don't really um, too much. So the pricing is, is, is more similar than it should be. And I, uh, economists will tell you that it takes four, European economists often say it takes four competitors to actually fight with each other. There's, it's too easy to signal. And it's too much in the interest of, uh, remember, they, they have fiduciary duties to their shareholders to pay off, you know, to keep share prices high, 
to drive as much as possible into dividends, the one the, some of the highest dividend generating co companies in the country. So they want us to feel as if this access is a luxury, not a utility. And so that's the way it's marketed, that's the way it's felt. And these cities that are taking the big moves to go towards fiber and make it more of a utility will see giant spillover effects in other parts of their economy, but that money won't go right back to the fiber company. So it's just a totally different mindset, different model. And in Somerville and places on the East Coast where there is some Fios and some cable, we're not seeing huge uh, competitive effects. Looking for, yes, uh, can we have a mic over here? Sorry, I've got a mic over here. I'm gonna trump you. Um, I'm Mary Gray, hi. Um, I I, I'm in charge, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I was looking at her, because I knew she would. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm really excited to read this book, and I want the book that will, um, that will challenge recentering fiber mm -hmm. as the new technology, that if we just have that technology there, it makes all the difference. Like yeah. something that will, with your analogy of the airport, not just say, yeah, we need airports, as in we need wire, but that we also need roads to the airports that are support infrastructure for people to actively participate. So mm -hmm. even literacy. We still don't teach right. basic tech or media literacy. We treat it like it's a given or an obvious thing. So mm -hmm. I guess that, that would be my push is to see how this can um, how this cannot replay a lot of the conversations around digital access. And I think Paul uh, DiMaggio and Esther Hargitay's work on digital inequalities mm -hmm. is the thing that I want kind of um, worked through in this, mm -hmm. that there's still these inequalities that aren't about having access to fiber. So Sure, although, yeah, no, I got you. And yeah. I talked to Esther a lot about that work when she was doing it. I think as people die off, um, things, things will change. But we, we, we have a huge need to bring everybody up to a level playing field. I have, I, I'm with you. If, yes. Um, What's your name? Thank you so much for, for speaking on this. Yeah. Um, my name is Caroline Tro, and I'm a researcher up at the Fletcher School at Tufts, um, and I work on a project called the Digital Evolution Index, measuring the rate and state of digital change around the world. Mm -hmm. And this element of access is such a huge issue because you can't talk about digital evolution unless people have got access. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, how do you solve the, the last mile issues and costs? Mm -hmm. uh, and you brought up the example of rural Vermont, but we're seeing this even in New York City where the pass-by regulations make that people don't get fiber to their houses. And is then wireless broadband going to be the stopgap issue to, to help overcome costs related to the last mile? Mm. All right. Well, there are about three different things in there, so, uh, but I love this. Yes, there is cost involved. One of the great things that we're doing here uh, at Harvard is, is the team fiber effort, which is... A lot, lot of it is devoted to uh, lowering the barriers to financing solutions for uh, wholesale fiber. Here's the problem. There's a lot of capital sloshing around um, that would be interested in being directed to projects that will pay off until the sun explodes, which is what this is. It, it doesn't pay off at 20%, but it pays off a modest rate of return forever once you get people signed up. But uh, we have to find ways of... Um, lowering the cost of access to that capital. So, for example, I've written about um, taking a hard look at the Buy America bonds that were set up at the beginning of the Obama administration that made available to uh, foreign banks and sovereigns around the world and other kinds of corporations the ability to invest in American infrastructure and passed along to those borrowers um, uh, subsidy, basically, a small subsidy that made it worth their while to borrow the money. The problem for municipals right now borrowing money is that they only have access to people who are looking for a write-off against their taxes, and all those foreign banks and other guys don't need a write-off against their American ta taxes. So we're limiting our access to capital. But we also just have to make it simple. A lot of banks don't understand this product, don't understand how it could be financed. And um, I, we're hoping to put out lots of playbooks on exactly that. New York City, so I have a place in New York, care a lot about New York, and it has not happened. One of the big problems there is that the city has not acted as the regulator it actually is. City has regulatory authority over the conduit under Manhattan and the Bronx, and has just sat back and, uh, okay, short story about telco consolidation. There was a time when there were bristling wires all over New York City for telephones, and they all fell down in the hurricanes. These were competing telephone companies kind of battling it out. New York City said, forget it. We don't want to have all these wires. 
All you guys have to cooperate and go into one tube underground conduit. We're going to call it Empire City Subway. So that was great. So you still had a competing phone market, but they had to go under, under the sidewalks, and the city was the regulator of that conduit. I'll say fast forward. All of those phone companies have consolidated. So it turns out that the entity that is Empire City Subways is now a subsidiary of Verizon. Yeah, and so it owes two allegiances. It, it has a regulator, which is the city, but when the phone it gets answered, it's answered by a Verizon employee who has no particular interest in opening up new conduit or making it available at a reasonable price. So all kinds of problems, and the city could have been more emphatic. Here's a huge problem for cities that the Danes are shocked by. Every American city gets 5% of the um, pay TV revenue of your local cable company. That's a lot of money. And you could put that to very good use for all kinds of good digital projects. You'd have to run the risk of cutting away from that stream of income coming to you as a condition of moving towards an open fiber system, which in the long run would be much more uh, beneficial to your city than getting that little 5%. But mayors aren't in office forever. They're in office for a short time. So their they're, uh, time horizon is short. So that's the New York story, and it's, it's a trail of tears. Um, wireless could be a stopgap. What I worry about is that everybody says, oh, we're fine, we've got wireless, just as we said, we're fine, we've got cable, and we're not fine. And that's why these, what's happening in other countries is more relevant to me, uh, other markets that are developing that won't happen here. Yeah. Yes, they have over here. Um, well, Susan, uh, my two suggestions for your list mm -hmm. would be addressing climate change and creating a more equitable sharing economy. In okay. The, the innovative uh, economic development that goes along with both of those. OK, that's great. Yeah, energy independence is a kind of a shorthand for that. Yeah, yeah. But it's got to be more. OK. Robin Chase is the person who talks about that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of thinking on that issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK, what else would you do if you were me? What would Saul do? I would worry about keeping all this democratic Mm -hmm. um, that there not be concentrations of data and sort of privileged surveillance enabled by, you know, all the sensors. Um, mm -hmm. um, you particularly see that in the, quote, transportation revolution, unquote, where mm -hmm. um, I mean, Google's linked New York City is actually, you know, it's marketed as free Wi-Fi mm -hmm. for digital equity, but it's really a, you know, a sensor platform and an advertising platform Mm -hmm. um, and Google has more transport, knows about how we move in ways nobody ever has. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, concentrations of data are going to be um, concentrations of power, just like mm -hmm. concentrations of capital are. Yeah. Um, That's very useful. And I think of Uber along those lines, too, because Uber has a ton of data that will be facilitated by all of this and, and could launch the only um, fleet of self driving cars. Uh, based on all their data and based on what that concentration of data. You know, the, so up the stack, you're right. There are all kinds of problems that could emerge in concentration of data. I guess I'm preferring to lay a little low and just say, let's make the fiber as open as possible and then hope that our competition authorities uh, and others, I realize it's a duck, but I'm, I'm trying to look at the positive of this. Uh, and that, that's why I'm so focused on wholesale fiber. The story in Stockholm is that 20 years ago, the city fathers decided they didn't want to be under the thumb of any one incumbent. They wanted fiber, and they only wanted to dig up the streets once. They're very neat. So they said, we're going to do this. We're going to gradually lay down passive infrastructure, so those glass tubes, but no lasers through them, not lit, not competing in the private market, just a wholesale, it's like a street grid. Stockholm put that dark fiber, it's called, down first two businesses, and now they reach 100% of all businesses and all residences in Stockholm. Every time they get a new flood of Syrian refugees, they said, oh, OK. And they open up uh, more rail lines and more fiber. That's just, it's just infrastructure, basic infrastructure. And there are 100 competing providers available in Stockholm when you flip open your laptop. Not just providers of internet access service, also things like you know, dedicated health services, um, home security. Maybe they're not as worried about that as we are. Uh, but uh, just many, many different kinds of things happening on top of that fiber. So the city made that possible. It long ago paid for itself. 
it's now a source of revenue. Um, the leasing operation of that fiber is a source of revenue for Stockholm. So it's a great story. It's so sensible. And I, I, I'm never embarrassed to be an American. I'm very proud to be American. But the, when I met the mayor, she said, I'm just so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, what can we do? How can we help? So you have to get used to that when you talk, talk to them about our situation here, because they, they are stunned about how bad it is. Are you with it? OK, yes, Bruce. Right, so our situation is a result of our politics. Our politics. And, as, and I think as you're writing this, I'd be interested to know what is it about our politics that will make this a challenge, in particular to the United States as opposed to Stockholm or Dubai or those other countries. Mm -hmm. And what, how can we prevent this move to fiber from being co-opted in the same way that right. wireless or cable was? Because yeah. I'm going to read this and say, it's going to be the same old. We're going to come up with mm -hmm. these promises and ideas, and in five years, it'll be two companies again. That's really so helpful. So how can we make that not happen? Yeah. Yes, that's great. Yeah, and it's this big flip, I think, and I've got to somehow argue that, that it becomes viewed as, as a street grid. But that takes enormous, that takes videos, right? We've got to do, we've got to reach people. It takes... Um, Stephen Colbert, I mean, it's something uh, in his old incarnation. It, uh, it takes, uh, what's, what, who's the guy, net neutrality? John Oliver. John Oliver. It takes John Oliver. That's what we need, um, is his explaining this is just basic stuff. It's just like running water. And then if everybody agrees, then the mayors have more political cover, and then they can take the brave moves, and then gradually this percolates up to the national level. What I'm really concerned about is that this doesn't appear to be on the radar screens of any presidential candidate. It's not relevant. And yet... It should be, because that's, this is where all these future jobs are going to come from, and a future middle class. But it's, it's politically viewed as pretty dangerous. I, but just 10 days ago, the president criticized, in a sense, the cable industry by making a filing saying, these set-top boxes, why are we paying so much for them? Uh, and that, that was quite a moment. I, eight years ago, unthinkable, unthinkable that uh, the cable industry was really viewed as untouchable. And now they're more like big pharma, big tobacco. Something is having a choking effect on the country. And so we may be able to make this, this political move. But I agree with Bruce. It, it's, uh, otherwise, we'll just recapitulate the whole thing. Anybody else? Anybody else? I don't know. I love, yes, I'd love to have a question. Two thoughts, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> so one is I think your book is going to have to burst the Silicon Valley bubble. Mm -hmm. like, I think there's a perception that America is the most innovative nation, you know, Google and Apple are doing all these amazing things, right. you know, look at them, we're so far ahead, we don't need to worry, right? right. So you've got to engage with that, I feel, to, to mm -hmm. show that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, I feel that Americans, much less than citizens of other countries, like don't, say Canada, well, like say Canada, no, <laughs> don't care about cross-national comparisons, right? Oh. The fact that, oh, you know, our, we're like 26 on the OECD ranking on whatever, doesn't register yeah. as much as a our state is so far behind. Like, look at our state compared to the, you know the fifty state survey is sort of like a dominant mode of analysis. And if you can p find a case study other than Chattanooga of a place where you know okay. things are happening in right. the United States, there's been you know maybe Chattanooga is good, um, and, and hold that up. I think that yeah. would be really effective. That's really really helpful. You're right. We're parochial. We don't care what these other countries are doing. Yeah. And there are some cities, unfortunately, really is Chattanooga that's coming to mind because it's the most well-developed. And they're using it for smart grid. Maria's doing a wonderful work on this, as well as other uses. And they're seeing big companies move to town. Um, but it would be good to get others, get, get more of a story. The problem is, if, if it's just you in, the, in America that has the fiber connection, you sort of say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, but there's no one to talk to. Uh, so in the Google Kansas City demo place they took me to, they said, just zoom in on that painting. Well, that's fine. But, you know, it's not really, uh, you know, they're little pods. It's a critical mass problem. They're little pods of fiber, and it's not everywhere. Here's a cool experiment. The librarians in Kansas City, in Burlington, Vermont, and in Chattanooga all opened up fiber windows in their kids' rooms so that the kids could play with each other, talk to each other, get used to having this fiber connection among them. And I'm excited. I want to know what, that, what happens there. And a friend of mine with a string conservatory in Macon, Georgia, is opening a fiber connection to string players in Miami so that they can do that string quartet thing. And I'm really excited about that. So once we have some visceral, OK, string quartets are insufficiently visceral, um, <laughs> something that grabs people's attention about music making. What? It'll be 
always sex. So, well, it's always <laughs> sex. There's this great book, Obscene Prophets, that tell, talks about the adult industry going ahead of everybody else every single time. And with all, there's Kevin Kelly has just been exploring Magic Leap. Go look for this in Wired. And um, the I, Magic Leap is actually going to put little images on your retinas, and it will uh, overlay your physical world with other images. Um, OK, so just imagine that, plus haptic devices just let your mind wander. Anything's <laughs> possible. And that is probably a direction where we'll see some investment. But that maybe I should go talk to some adult industry people and get them to be on my side. Yeah. <sighs> OK. OK. Anybody have any contacts I could use? <laughs> That's a, that's a good one. OK. What else? Yeah. Here, is the mic, mic coming? I just want to follow up on that thought, because mm -hmm. I think if we can change the expectations of an, a coming generation, right. we will actually change what we do. Um, and I think we're kind of seeing that in the election, right, where we really do have a generational gap yeah. between what you know one generation thinks we should be doing and what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and for younger people, this sounds like, well, she's talking about air. Of course we need more internet access. Of course we do. It's essential for everything. And they should expect cheap, uh, you know, basically unlimited access. Uh, that's my Mac talking to us. Um, and it would be good to foster that, make that expectation even stronger, and not make it feel like perhaps the Sanders campaign may feel now, like you're sort of like my big brother, five years older, would put his hand on my head, and I could flail away with my wrists, but it made no difference. And if you feel like that about this issue, that could make it even worse. But then everybody will flee America and go live in other countries, or go live in the places that have fiber. I do think you would be dumb to buy a house these days that didn't have this connection, and dumb to move to a community that didn't have it. So that, that should have a big effect. Uh, in the back. Uh, so what are some of the things that each of us in this room could do within our own little bubble uh, over the next, you know, five years to, to help this cause and make sure that we get the infrastructure appropriately? Well, good question. I think um, every university should be a platform for convening the local officials, the people who know something about fiber, the activists, to uh, make sure that people are having the right conversation and are learning from this very friendly community across the country that trades information about fiber. Learning from best practices, understanding financing um, possibilities, uh, making it just a common question for every political race, every debate. Of course we're going to have fiber. So what are you going to do to bring that about? So for me, the franchise model would be to have these neutral but really powerful um, sources of community organizing everywhere and lend whatever expertise you have to it. But since you're here, I'm going to make sure that you, you work on ours. Um, but there are, going to be, there are going to be others, too, I hope, that will emerge. Can I just add, there are things going on in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville. Yeah. you're a resident of any of those cities and aren't involved in Wannabe, you can talk to Saul or I about Cambridge. Mm -hmm. or yeah. That's important, because it's hard to get people excited about this stuff, and there are efforts going on. Right, and that's why we need this human story to get them more excited about it, and lost opportunities, lost generations, yeah, all that is going to help. Right now. Yeah. So Patrick's on the Cambridge Broadband Council task force, as is Saul. So these are, they're, they're, they're talking about it. They have a consultant. They're working through their plans, but they could use, I'm sure, energy. Yep. Yeah, it's all, it's the, so this region is starting to bubble up, uh, which is good. And that should be happening everywhere in the country. So yes. I was wondering, are, do you think universities are doing enough? I mean, like, like here we are at Harvard, you know, right. we have, you know, presumably a connection to, to the internet backbone here, and mm -hmm. yet you're, you're describing to us these things that, 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 that if we could only see them, we'd understand how great uh, fiber could be, right. and so I'm wondering why we haven't seen them here. Yeah. You know, like 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 shouldn't fiber and the, you know the amazing things that 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 this ultimate high speed broadband can do, mm -hmm. shouldn't it be like a visceral part of every curriculum and of every class, so that when students leave Harvard or any every other university, um, 
that can afford to do that, they're going to their businesses, yeah. you know, their next places of employment, their, when they're looking to buy a home, you know, whatever it is, they're saying, I cannot live without this because I just had four years <sighs> of this amazing thing. And yeah. so, you know, what, what more can we be doing here at Harvard and yeah. at our peer institutions to help create that kind of environment? That's a great question, and we clearly could be doing more. Like even in Cambridge, why is why are Harvard and MIT not part of the Cambridge Broadband Task Force discussion? What's going on here? Surely they, they have assets to contribute. Kira has her hand up. Thanks for talking about this. Um, uh -huh. I've loved hearing you talk about it all the time. Yeah. Um, so something that maybe you've touched upon in different ways, but wasn't expressly outlined in this mm -hmm. list is um, you started this talk with um, bringing up the sh massive shift to large urban communities. Mm -hmm. And many of the communities that have sort of taken it upon themselves to build uh, fiber networks for their communities have not been those larger areas, but actually more rural places. And it could be, um, you know, thanks to the potential for uh, teleworking and mm -hmm. um, small and medium enterprises, like you mentioned, um, it could be a way to sort of slow that shift mm -hmm. to the super urban and also preserve smaller communities, um, allow them to be more robust in their economies um, and, you know, appeal to those people who really don't want a large urban yeah. setting to live and raise their families, but right now feel like they have no other option. That is terrific. Yeah, great things come from small places. And there's no reason why you should have to move away from your town just because you can't work remotely. And you keep your next generation in place. So tiny towns all over the country have done this kind of thing and talk about that value. And it's very important to keep that on the list. I, I appreciate that. Hi, Susan. Hi. This is fascinating. Um, I'm still astonished that our leaders and policymakers, this is, hasn't been on their radar for the last 20, 30 years at mm -hmm. least, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you tra track this back somehow as another sort of fallout of the end of the Cold War and mm. the sort of, sort of loss of the sense of having to think nationally and get our, our, all of our uh, young people educated in a certain way, mm -hmm. starting from President Eisenhower with mm -hmm. the highway infrastructure. Right. Right? That is the exact analogy. This is the here. exact an yeah. analogy. And, yeah. you know, Gore was sort of laughed out of the room for making e that exact analogy right. once upon a time about the Internet superhighway. Right. Um, do you think that is tied to the political question that hmm. a couple of people in the room have asked, the sort of just huh. dispersion of a lack of even just if you want to look at it as a sort of national egotism around prestige. Right. The idea that we're that far down the list mm -hmm. among our, our peer countries and some we wouldn't consider or wouldn't want to be in the same room with. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. It was almost the image of the Soviet astronaut or, or the Sputnik rocket, the thing that could be seen that got there first. Yeah. This has been so, so slow moving. We don't have that totemic, that moment that gets everybody into science grad school and drives money into it. It's just as important, I think. Um, but, but you're right. We we need to make this like that Sputnik moment. Yeah, that sort of economic yeah. regulatory um, mm -hmm. vacuum that opened up in mm -hmm. certain sectors at the end of the Cold War. That's that a big to... thought. That's a bigger thought than I've, I've had in months. It's a big thought. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Wilson. That's really that's really useful. Yeah, and, and Eisenhower had a kind of appeal that no national leader has. You know, he he'd been a great general. He was sort of viewed as bipartisan, tremendous leader, uh, and just said, well, we need this. And it, it happened. So we don't seem to, we don't do that, and we're not worried about other countries because we just stay where we are, except we are worried about terrorists, which makes us do things unreasonably sometimes. So I, you know, I don't know, but you're right. There's, there's some big shift. Deregulation market will solve everything. We don't need to worry. Industrial policies become kind of a swear word. If you say something should be an industrial policy, people say, oh, 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 oh we don't do that in America. And um, that's a problem because these other countries do. And there are some things where uh, it would really help to have industrial policy. Oh, the Dahlia. Um, being recorded. I oh, yeah. Um, 
just kind of picking backing off the last two comments, I do think what you started with the human element about this, mm -hmm. I think is a critical piece of this and is what could tie together the drier elements of this. Thinking of the John Oliver narrative, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think really doing, and it's difficult research to do, I think, but doing some empirical research, as someone who's experienced that fiber to fiber insane connection through like a Cisco conference room, mm -hmm. um, it's a very elite environment mm -hmm. and how that could impact individuals on such a fundamental level, mm -hmm. I think is such a key element of this conversation. So I definitely would spend some meaningful time on that just to tie together why this is so important. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's where you get the local regulators to start thinking differently about this. If they can mm -hmm. think about how to talk to their own citizenry, if they can think about how this impacts them in the short term, to your point about they're only in office for X amount of time. Yeah. I think that human element is really important and mm -hmm. to be able to convey that would be really, really powerful. Thank you, that's really helpful. And every once in a while I think I'm thinking about compassion and empathy too much and I should stop. But actually it's at the heart of this yeah. and uh, I think it does connect people to the need for this. I think the fact that, here's some empirical stuff, this enormous blunk of older people that I'm going to be part of, uh, how, are, how are they going to have you know, a sense of connection? And, and this will reduce isolation. I mean, that's the hope. So that, that's great. That's great. And, and also allow uh, everybody to do their homework, the homework gap. What's that? Right. Yeah, right, which is a much better place to be. Yeah. Uh, another one from Bruce, unless there are new hands. Oh, here's a new hand over here on the right. Hello, um, just a, a short point, but one, one uh, element that could be very interesting is uh, exploring a bit the paradox that we're having right now of uh, being at Berkman and always raining about big data and all of the yeah. problems that go with big data and at the same time advocating for bigger data, more speed, more capacity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and for example, if we have more data, as you have shown the uh, example of self-driving cars, yeah. we're already at a point where we have uh, non-discrimination of data that's not usable anymore, we just store it in service somewhere. More data will mean more capacity for servers, for more, uh, more um, uh, storage as well, maybe more power to the cloud entities that hold, uh, that hold mm -hmm. these data. So mm -hmm. it would be nice to explore the sort of butterfly effects that could uh, happen with fiber. Oh, I appreciate that. And I, uh, I think for me personally, the benefits of uh, data uses could be so human and are so great and do touch so many different industries that I tend to be optimistic about it. Um, and also having more, more competing providers lowers the risk, I believe, of intense concentrations of, of data. But um, we'll see. Yeah, Bruce. So the, the compassion point, I think, is really important. So yeah. You're making an argument at, at many levels, at yes. economic levels. But, but fundamentally, you're making a, a psychological argument. Mm. You make an argument about human connection. Mm -hmm. And I think if you ground that argument well, It'll motivate a lot of what else you're saying, yeah. whether that's through stories or research or data or anecdote. I mean, I, I don't know, but you're making a very strong statement about the how this powers human connection that yeah. has all of these follow-on effects. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's really helpful. I, I think it's, I think it really would be really a good motivator. Great. And this really came home to me. I went to see the a young man who started the virtual reality meetup in Stockholm. And I said, you know what I'm really interested in is eye contact. And he said, he kind of like twinkled. He said, well, yes, we're working on that. Um, because it would be really great for people in virtual reality worlds to accurately track your eyes so they know exactly what you're looking at. Now, obviously, the commercial applications of this are enormous. We know what you want to buy, where you're paying attention. But the human possibilities are also enormous. So this whole idea of the eyes expressing so much and are not really being able to see them using existing Skype connections, I, I think it's could be a grabby thing, and I want to I want to hang on to it. And if the gaming industry is looking at it, that means the adult industry is looking at it, which means there are other drivers that will uh, help the whole thing along. Ah, yes, Adam. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, 
I know you want to keep it positive, so yep. some other time I'll ask you about the privacy implications of collecting all the wonderful data. Well, that, that's described. why I keep talking about wholesale fiber networks. So there are a whole bunch of competing no, providers. I mean the, the censored city, that sort of thing, yep. the surveillance aspect. That's but, why we need wise policy leaders who have been trained at Harvard Law School. <laughs> but I want, to, I want to follow up Bruce's empathy psychological memory and the Sputnik idea. <laughs> and the thing I think I would love to hear more about, perhaps you've already been thinking about it, but is um, you were saying, who knows someone in the adult industry? I need to get them on my side. And it seems like the question you, you really need to be asking is, to my ear, as you frame this, this is just painfully obvious. Yeah. Yes, this makes so much sense. It's be so wonderful. Why aren't we doing this? Well, yeah. why aren't we doing this? There must be someone who doesn't want it done. Right, the status quo does not want to have it done. So who do you need to get on your side? Oh, interesting. Uh, people who are actually worried about national security will worry about this sometimes. Right. There are lack of a resilient communications, yeah. multiply redundant communications That's great. network. I mean, that, that conjures up how the DOD is at the yeah. forefront, the point of the spear with respect to green energy, because they, they know what it's going to take if in a petroleum. Yeah, it's interesting. There are just a few companies that are really benefiting from the status quo, and everybody else is suffering. And so if you could look at people who are worried about our national competitiveness, you know, big thinkers about the economy, pension funds that have trillions of dollars, they should be worried about this. Um, it's the whole substrate for everything. So you're right, I, I should figure out who those other actors are and not just the, the niche ones. That's a right, good suggestion. Right, so there's people with power, the ones yeah. you just described, but there's also people who are influence, uh, opinion shifters. Mm -hmm. And the Sputnik moment thing made me think, um, I, I know you're a Stevenson fan. I am. Um, of a, his Solve for X speech a few years ago where he said, you know, why, why aren't we writing about moonshots anymore? You know, why is all fiction and all mm -hmm. science um, navel-gazing, you know, the best minds of my generation writing iPhone apps? Yeah. And it just seems that maybe another aspect of this, and I think you're already on track for it with Team Fiber, is who are the best people, constituency, stakeholders, you know, choose your um, collective noun, to be telling the inspirational stories yeah. to shift opinion and perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to get David Petraeus to talk about this, or somebody like that, who really is thinking about the country in a big way and understands what we need. Um, OK, we're just about out of time. Who wants to ask like the, the glowing, wonderful question that sends us all on our way, the lunched? Anybody? OK. Yeah. <laughs> so you say we need, we need a Sputnik moment. Yeah. On the other hand, well, we've got say, it. We've got the Sputnik moment. We just need to package it better. On the other hand, you say we've already, you know, you can look at this, that chart and say, well, Sweden, South Korea, Norway, Estonia, I forget what else, but those Japan. are like four countries everybody's heard of that are, that are above China's us. China's not a member of the OECD. Right. So is there something we can point to and, you know, make a big video saying, you know, they do this in Sweden or, or South Korea every day. We're oh. missing this. Oh, good. This is my inspirational moment, ready to close on. Those other countries, especially I've spent a lot of time now in Seoul and in Stockholm, they, they, they're wonderful, but they have some faults that we don't have. Okay, so in Stockholm, things are really too neat. It's just way too neat. And in fact, they, they said, we need to import some grit. They're not, they're very polite, you know, sort of standoffish. Not, they don't have the entrepreneurial zeal. They're trying to develop zeal. They keep talking about zeal, but, but it, it's, gonna, it's a little out of their character. So for them, they say, well, of course we have fiber, but they're not thinking about all this other stuff all the time. They're beginning to, but they haven't so far. That's their problem. In Seoul, it's just too hierarchical. Uh, Samsung just comes and drops on you if you start a startup. They'll just buy you, you know, and they, and, you know, what percentage of 18-year-old girls get plastic surgery? There's just this, it's, a, it's strange to my view, and, and not, it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of freedom to do new things. It's also a pretty small place as a market just 60 million people in the whole country. We have 330. So we've got stuff that, you know, the people can be great at a very young age here. They don't have to wait and address people differently depending on how old they are, as you do in, in South Korea. Um, we have a lot of messiness. We're good at messiness. We could have more, probably. But uh, so if America made this move, we would see benefits that those other places haven't. And that's what, to me, is so exciting about the possibility of an upgrade, that our national spirit is what's going to make this truly great. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. <laughs>